Happy Thursday to you. I am Jen Yates. You're locked on Generation Nation with the Generator. We're on LRS102.com, the Walrus Broadcasting Live from the Launch Louisville Studio down on East Broadway, and I'm super pumped today. I'm always pumped. <laughs> That's how you have to be on radio. I have Bob Ramsey up in the studio. How are you doing, Bob? I'm good. Good to be here. Yes. Uh, you know, it's funny. I've heard about you for years, which is interesting, and I don't know how we have not crossed paths before now. That is amazing, because I play with just about everybody, and it's been I can't believe we haven't been on a stage together. Yeah, and same. I've played with almost everybody in this town i feel like everybody who's come in on the show i have played with except for you i think oh, we're gonna have to change that aren't we? yeah let's change that All up right. yeah i like that idea so bob you're kind of like a louisville staple from what i understand i have been yes and uh i uh i've got all kinds of great questions for you just about your career in music have you always been in louisville yeah i grew up here grew up in uh in shively oh lively shively uh-huh. went to western i was in the band there high school band that's western this, middle uh, uh, western or high school Western High School? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, And that's how all this got started. Yeah, very cool. You know, my dad lived in Louisville in the 70s in Shively. That was me. And he's told me all kinds of crazy stories, so maybe you and my dad kind of, who knows, he was a drummer. We probably played together. Maybe. Yeah, he uh, did a lot of touring from age 10 on around the state and has played with a lot of cool people over the years, mostly in South Central Kentucky, though, because uh, when him and my mother had me... He got the nine to five basically and was doing that, but he always did music on the side. So, well, I went to. Uh, there were three brothers, Yates brothers, that I went to school with. Oh yeah. Well, as far as I know, I don't have any family in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, they're all Lake Cumberland, South Central, and all the Yates are kind of spread around nowadays. But they're you know mostly all over Kentucky. Awesome. Yeah. So who knows? But you probably did cross paths at oh, some. I had to. Yeah. Did you ever get to play South Central Kentucky at all ever? Do you ever play Club 68 or oh any of those, good you know? Oh, gracious, yes. Yeah, you did? Okay, oh, yeah. so that's kind of my area there. You know, yeah. I, I grew up hearing the stories about Club 68. Good, good and Lord. All the uh, crazy that went on there. And, and there was another one across the, down the street and across the street. Uh, I can't remember oh, the I name of it. I knew Golden it. Nugget or yeah, something like that. Yeah, the Golden Nugget, yeah. The Horseshoe. Yeah, Golden Horseshoe. Maybe I, I can't remember. It yeah. was Golden. <laughs> it was Golden. <laughs> oh, I need sound effects. Where's my sound effects? The, yeah. Uh, uh, Club 68 was notorious. It was just. Uh, I've never seen so many drunk people in my life. And yeah. Probably the world's worst men's restroom. Oh, really? Good Lord. Oh, wow. I haven't heard any stories about that. But, I, you know, growing up, uh, I would read articles in the paper. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we actually read the papers back then um, about, you know, Ike and Tina playing through there. All right. the greats played there. Yeah, in the 60s, that place was the showroom. Mm-hmm. And in, in and around here, I mean... It's it, Elmer George, isn't it? I, I think, think it's so. Elmer yeah. George, yeah. He had some affiliation with family of mine. And my family is a dare, but they were always around, you know, Marion Taylor, Ray Wick, that whole, you know, we're spread out, like I said. Well, I played there with a band called Caribou. Oh, I love Caribou. Yeah. Are you in Caribou? I was. Okay. Then. And then, uh, this would nice. be uh, mid 80s, I guess. Yeah. Um, I grew up loving Caribou. Once I got to Louisville, and I had seen Caribou prior to that, seems like at State Fair, somewhere like mm-hmm. that. Um, but I was a huge fan of Caribou. Oh, yeah. They're still going strong. Yeah, I know. I know. It's Isn't crazy. It, it is awesome. I love any band that can stick around for a long time Absolutely. because. As I know myself, <laughs> I've been through like 30 or 40 bands now, you know, but I always feel like it's not because I'm hard to work with. It's always because I'm looking for some kind of creative spark more with my music than just like cover band stuff. You sure. know, I'm always looking for sparks with players and I love to play with new people that I've never played with. And we were just talking about Jimmy Brown. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to get to play together in September for the Highland Pride Festival, which is going to be super pumped. I've never played with him other than an audition here and there where he was just filling, you know, so I can't wait for well, that. I can't wait a, to get to play with you. As a drummer, you're going to love Jimmy. Oh, I know. Gotta, I can't you're wait. You have a fabulous partner. I know. He's like butter every time I see him. And he looks so happy when he plays. And I'm the same way. It makes me happy to play. So I can't wait to like look at him and smile real it's big. It's his energy, know? man. Yeah, I know, right? And his energy just, just is like a, he's he's that rising tide that lifts all the boats. Yeah. I love playing with oh, him. Oh, well, I can't wait to play with him. Can't wait to play with you. I t- We talked about Kemet. I got to play with her for the first time technically at She Castle. Uh, we worked side by side for years and never ever yeah. got to do any projects together. So I'm really excited to, you know, to continue those relationships and get to play with new people and Absolutely. find the new magical spark, you know. Well, I should have brought my keyboard. Yes, you should have. Why well, didn't you bring a keyboard? I don't know. Next time. 
or at least one of those, what are those things that you blow and you have the keyboard? And it's a melodica. Melodica. I mm. love those things. Those are so cool. Yeah. So, Bob, let's talk about, just because I don't know a lot about you, let's let our listeners at LRS 102 know, how did you get your start in music? Uh, my older sister and brother, band uh, people, they play band instruments. My uh, older sister also played piano. Cool. So uh, I was blown away. I'm much younger than them, and I, I saw them marching, and I thought, well, okay, they've got a police-type hat. They've got authority. Yeah. They're making noise. No yeah. one's mad. You're talking about the marching band yeah, costume? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'd say, that's it. I'm, I'm going to do this. And uh, so as soon as I could, I started playing trumpet, and uh, that led me to high school band. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, around, I guess, 15 or so, I guess when it was a sophomore, our stage band was just really not good. Yeah. And had a lot of really old, stinky material. One of my buddies said, uh, why don't you just start writing the charts for the high school stage band? And I, oh, wow. I don't know how to do that. And I uh, started using my big sister's piano to figure it out. And the band director let me have it. And that's how I learned wow. to play the keyboard. How wild. Was writing charts because all the horns are in different keys. Mm-hmm. And if you want... You have to transpose. I have to transpose mm-hmm. constantly. So I was teaching myself the relativity of all the keys to themselves. I'd learn the song in concert key and then... Transpose it for the trumpets, transpose it for the saxophones. Wow, what a way to start I out. Really I mean, transposing <sighs> seems to be very hard for a lot of people, you uh, know what I mean? We were being taught th- theory in high school band at the same time, so it was kind of all tied in. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's how I kind of backdoored. Well, gee, if I learn one lick mm-hmm. in the key of C, I can now apply it. To every To scale. every other yeah. scale. Yeah. And uh, that's how I kind of backdoored getting into playing keyboards, and I never would have thought, never would have dreamt that... Mm-hmm. I'd be a keyboard player now all these, you know, 40 years later. Wow, that's fascinating. You know, as a, I'm a drummer, percussionist. I started on clarinet and uh, saxophone. Actually started on drums, but um, in high school, in, mm. con, you know, concert band, I would play clarinet, bass clarinet. Um, wow. I always, I did take a lot of piano lessons growing up from my church guy who, you know, who was awesome. Um, it never stuck, but my grandmother played dulcimer and the piano and the organ. I actually mm. own a couple of organs, believe nice. it or not. Yeah, they're not anywhere close to here um, because transporting an organ is not the easiest thing. But Been there. Yeah, Been there but growing there. up, you know, I was always sitting behind a little keyboard with my my granny and, um, and there's still some pump organs and some really fascinating things that she left behind and that my dad has collected over the years. But either way, um, you know, I teach bells a lot to kids Great. and stuff like that. Just yesterday, I was teaching the uh, the, the the wheel. <laughs> I call it the wheel. What is it? The uh, yeah, circle the of, circle, of, circle fifths. of fifths. Yeah, yeah, circle of fifths for all the major keys and stuff like that. And you'll love this. The, I was teaching the sharps. So, you know, we're starting on the sharp mm-hmm. side, and I was like, you know, there's an order of sharps. I was teaching the kid, and I was like, this is not a hashtag. This is a sharp. You know, right? And I said, whatever you can do, man, to remember like the order. You know, remember it. And he said fried chicken <laughs> f and c was the first two and i was like perfect that, that whatever works f f sharp c sharp man you know yeah absolutely yeah. so it's super cool i have a little bit of background but man i always wish i could play piano better but i love to practice scales and um i was just talking to my friend angie hopperton earlier today or last night about you know teaching that uh, whole whole half whole 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 half mm-hmm. idea because it's fascinating to me that on major scales that that works you know for just about anything yeah it's and it's uh, an interesting concept i love the theory of music and and the written notation too so what an interesting way to get your start in music by yeah. writing charge for a high school marching high band. school i was the stage band actually yeah the stage band meaning they weren't marching they were we were sitting on the stage during the basketball game oh, okay like a pet band yeah yeah super cool were you all playing like rock and roll and stuff like See, that that was or? the whole thing we wanted to do we, we were playing all this really 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 old stuff mm-hmm. and uh one of the first things i wrote was Watermelon Man, a uh, Quincy Jones chart. And, cool. Uh, then we started doing some stuff from Jesus Christ Superstar. And oh, I love Chicago. Jesus Christ I mean, Superstar. we were rocking. Yeah, it yeah. was cool. Chicago, the band? Yeah. Okay. Because nowadays we have the musical, too. You right. know, it's like you never know which one. <laughs> yeah. My dad was a huge Chicago fan. In Me fact, too. 25 or 6 to 4 is like one of the first songs I ever studied. Awesome. Yeah. 
Um, that and Frankenstein by Edgar Winter. Yeah, love it. Love it. <laughs> I heard that double drum solo in the middle and was like, whoa, I want to learn how to, how they do that, you know. Um, but growing up, I had a, we had a drum room right beside my bedroom. And anytime I wouldn't get up to go to school, if I slept in late, my dad would be rocking that drum kit to wake me up. So That's the best alarm clock ever. <laughs> it's the loudest alarm clock ever. And it's been relentless, ever. too, yeah. Yeah, and I tell you what, it, it's, it'll get you out of bed, that's for sure. That would be too. <laughs> Yeah. So, Bob, so you did that. Uh, did you ever do marching band? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm a big marching band geek. Of course, I Me come too. from Adair County. So, Adair County has a historic yeah. marching band. Yeah, they're traditional. Great. Yeah. They're still winning state championships. We used to compete against them and never win. Yeah. What's funny because uh, where I'm from, and I say this a lot, people put the music before the sports, which I think is fascinating looking at the world today because, you know, I love sports. I was always a sport sport type chick but I always had music in me too and even going to college it was always like which one's going to win out softball or you know I was going on scholarships and stuff like mm-hmm. that was it going to be softball or music music ended up winning out but I still love to play sports but at the same time it was a tradition where I was from so if your family if your parents had been in that band they wanted you in that band they wanted your kids in that band yeah. you know and they're still going strong man I dare represent yeah, yeah. And, marching uh, band taught me a lot of things. Well, yeah, it's hard to play with eighty, ninety, a hundred. Well, Adair mm-hmm. County had a lot. Yeah, uh, you at gotta, one point, you got to get I... your time together mm-hmm. because you're spread out on a football field. And, exactly. And so if you're not playing real well together, you're not gonna not gonna have a good sounding band. Yeah, and there was all this pressure. I just remember all this pressure being on us because when I came in freshman year to marching band. They had already been winning consecutive state champs. So once you've been state yeah. champs for so long, it's up to the next class to like win it, you know. And there was a lot of pressure on it. I feel like we were a sixty-something piece band, and we had lost like twenty seniors the year I came in, um, and we were undefeated the entire time that I was there. Wow. Yeah, even the drumline completely undefeated. Um, not saying it was because of me. It was just because we had great teachers. And back then, there weren't the child labor laws. So we could actually practice like 40 hours a week on the field. And that's what we did until, you know, until our parents came and picked us up at dark. We were out there on that field. Yeah, we did the same thing. We did two days during the summer in the in mm-hmm. August yeah. after band camp drilling that same show over and over and over. Yeah. On Back up. then, did you have to go off to a camp? Like yep. Camp Crescendo? That Camp was, Crescendo. You went to Camp Crescendo? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I love that. My dad tells me stories about that place oh all goodness. the time. Yeah, he was telling me they used to crawl to the top of like the mountain and like do all kinds of scandalous we did, things. We did. Uh, we took a banner up there with Rudy Mosier's character that I drew. Yeah. Uh, and we, you know, he had him had him standing in a bucket of I can say shit, right? Yeah, of course. I'm going to ring the bell though. Shit, <laughs> you could see it from all over the camp <laughs> yeah. that we had done that. And uh, 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 there's so many funny things. The one of the other bands, the on the guys' side of, of the camp, decided they were all going to use uh, the same toilet. <laughs> okay. Without flushing. Oh, great! Fantastic. And, uh, we were all pulled out in our uh, underwear. Notice it was boys. It was boys. <laughs> I right. was going to say women wouldn't have done this that. Is, uh, maybe seventy one, seventy two. If you can, so you know, anybody out there wants to date, mm-hmm. uh, what we're talking about? You imagine the toilet facilities that I'm talking about. Anyway, was already nasty. <laughs> uh, they it was filled. Yeah. So we were all called out in the middle of the night in our underwear mm-hmm. and just got the ass chewing of our lives. Woo-hoo, yeah. Well, you deservedly so. You you may remember uh, I was there in the seventies. They used to have a talent show on like Friday night. Mm-hmm. So our talent show was recreating that. Yeah. Oh, speech. Nice. nice. Uh, True artistry, right there. And uh, they pulled the plug and sent everybody back to their rooms. I oh mean, it wow, was that's hilarious. So total, you guys uh, yeah, we kind of out the bad them. boys. Yeah, I love that. Well, you know. I was a bad child too in my in my teenage years. It's funnier. Oh yeah. It's a lot funnier. Oh yeah. I mean harmless things, but shenanigany and always like a little scandalous, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. <laughs> stirring it up, stirring Come it on, up. We're band geeks. We gotta, you know, yeah. do something cool. Exactly, yeah. So what instrument did you play back in those days? I started on trumpet. And that's trumpet, okay, yeah. And uh, I got braces and back in the day they used to twist the metal with the pointy sticking out. Mm-hmm. So putting that wax around ruined my armature. Oh, wow. So I had to go down to what they call euphonium, a baritone. Yeah. I thought it was a step down, but it it actually helped because I got familiar with the uh, uh, bass clef. Bass clef, yeah. Because it's a different setup, Mm -hmm. uh, even though they're both B-flat instruments. And that helped the piano playing and helped the the, uh, writing of the charts. I bet. You just can't, I couldn't have seen, Mm -hmm. foreseen 
all of this stuff that was going to happen and uh, ended up becoming much better on the euphonium uh, than I was on the trumpet and uh, started taking that to competitions mm-hmm. and uh, uh, summer summer camps and yeah. things like that. Ended Man, up- it's always hot when you start. It, they're starting uh, it right now. Actually, they probably already have been already, doing yeah. marching band camps. Yeah. yeah, It was always so hot. hot. And then by the time you go to state and you compete in those things, it's you know, freezing. cold, freezing. I yeah. remember... You know, it'd be 100-something degrees out at the camp, and then by the time we got to state, it was, I mean, ice pellets and snow, and, you know, there was always something crazy going right? on. Right, and, yeah. and I, I remember uh, one of the bonuses, they would let us march around the old Coney Island up in Cincinnati. If you march around, then the whole band gets to ride for free the whole day. I'm getting ready to play my trumpet, and a cicada Oh, wow. Right into the mouthpiece. Ooh. You know, that's, yeah. I'm, I'm throwing up the rest of the day. And, yeah. uh, uh, the, it's just stuff like that that people don't understand. It's hard to play these yeah. stupid things. Well, I was going to tell you, no, talking about that, the cicada, have you ever played Kingfish Jeff or Kingfish Louisville on this yes. side of the river? Yes, but not during a cicada outbreak. Oh, man, I did oh. <laughs> once. And I am not kidding you, and it was dark, so you've got the lights <laughs> shining on the band. <laughs> and, of course, those bugs are, are coming right at the lights. And I looked down... At my, I mean, I had to keep my mouth shut. I play drums. Yeah. I don't even open my mouth at the time. You know what I mean? But I had to keep it shut specifically because yeah. there were like hundreds everywhere. It was the creepiest uh, ever. Um, and I don't know what it was about that gig, but it was just bugs everywhere. Same thing on the river stage at a certain time of year. You know, we uh, I've gone swallowed so many bugs because right when we'll start, then the lights come on and they're all you know it's a it's yeah. a nightclub for them yeah exactly yeah <laughs> that's so cool so after you did that what made you want to get in bands like rock bands and stuff like that well it, it i had a taste of it from that stage band because there was a drummer and a bass player and, mm-hmm. and we were rocking and, and all of a sudden i wasn't a geek anymore and it was kind of cool oh yeah uh and so i started doing they just messing around playing one hand uh, on a keyboard sitting in with some buddies and uh i was going into when I got to college, I was doing well, but I started to notice that there was a lot of knuckle draggers that were going to get the same degree as me, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to. I just said, well, there, certainly there's something else I can do, so I thought I'd take some time off, and I got an invitation to move to uh, Orlando with some buddies and put a band together. Cool. And uh, got a Fender Rhodes. Awesome. my first keyboard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, what a great God. first keyboard. <laughs> Fabulous. And uh, started playing, and I just realized, man, I'm never going back. Yeah. This is it. This is what I want to do. Yeah. Just because you're a piano player, I wanted to tell you, I actually own a 1962 Farfisa. Ooh, me too. Do you really? I don't know what year it is, but my first keyboard was a, was a Farfisa organ. Uh-huh. I'm going to tell you my color scheme. Sure. You tell me yours. A, a cream with green trim, and the keys were, uh, the white keys were gray. The black keys were white. Oh, interesting. Well, this one is a compact deluxe, and Mine's a compact. It, yeah, it was like a yellow. It's like yellow on the sides, and then the keys are split into three groups of colors, and then with all the knobs, and then it was like, but there's a. The lower, like a the, red key, red, oh, keys, red keys, and there was gray keys, and there's yeah. also some black keys, but yeah. they weren't the normal black keys. Right, they're inverted. They were, yeah, they inverted them. Yeah, right, the, the le- white keys are black, and the black keys are white. Yeah. There's an octave down on the left hand side that's mm-hmm. inverted. Yeah, and those are the bass, and they probably do chords or something. I can't remember. It's been yeah, it does all kinds of wacky things yeah. and flute sounds and just you know, like I said, my grandmother was an organist. You know, so I grew up loving to punch all them buttons, and mm-hmm. and uh, also the organ she had had the pumps. Fo- the yeah. bass was your feet. Oh, the, well, okay. I thought you were talking about the the, the foot pedals. To, yeah, to keep the bellows going. Yeah. But so yeah. Th- there was keys on your feet, exactly like yeah. the piano, but they're really big and kind of wooden. Yeah. And it even had the you know it even had the the minors and or yeah. the flats and sharps as well, and yeah. literally. You know, that's kind of weird, I would think, for a keyboardist, if you have not done f- movement with your feet to hit bass chords. My, my, very uh, odd. My sister can do that. She can play the bass wow. with, her, with her feet. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. It's a, I would think it would be totally different. Like, you have to study that, I would uh, think. It's, yeah. it's just like uh, teaching your fingers. They, they they open up the book, and then there's another a third staff. Yeah. And yeah. they're doing scales just like they would if it was their fingers. Yeah, I always try to teach my students that, uh, you know, drum set, other than, say, keyboards, 
are the only instruments that read multiple lines. Mm-hmm. Like we're reading four lines because we have four limbs. You know what I mean? And God help you if you have percussion written in that too, because you just might have something else yeah. added in that you can't get to uh, without a second person. But um, yeah, you know, it's just a fascinating thing that uh, it's complicated. Instead of reading one line like a trumpet would just read one melody line, you know, all the way across, we're literally having to read four you know, four things all the all the way across. So it's, it's a, interesting. Interesting. You mentioned drumline. Uh, mm-hmm. The reason I chose Moorhead, I went to Moorhead oh, cool. State University. Oh, great school for they music. had the f- unbelievable marching band. Oh and yes, we would go there for competitions, uh, and the band was 150, 300 wind players, with 40 drum. Uh, players, yeah. percussion players, yeah, like drum line, and so they would the 150. They would play, and blow us all away, and then they'd leave, and the drums would play for another 10 minutes. Well, they had marching uh, marimba, yeah, marching back four, in the day. Marching, they marched marimba, marched marimba, march, marimba, <laughs> yeah. march uh, uh, percussion, uh, congas. Mm-hmm. Um, they would march uh, four crank tune. Uh, timpanis? Wow. I mean, they could play. That is insane. By I've never seen timpanis march. They don't do it anymore because yeah. of, of what you're, I mean, it's just too hard in the back. Right. Well, I was in charge of the pit. And so I played the pit, which is basically timpani, marimbas, mm. everything you, big that you couldn't move, drum set. Right. Um, but the coolest part about that was we got to play all the cool instruments. Like sure. we played brake drums off of cars and just all kinds of wacky things. Sometimes you got chains and, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah, all kinds of a railroad wheel? ties. Uh, yeah, a big piece of metal that's a, yeah. somebody's wheel. I've or, had or to play a sledgehammer before. Awesome. I mean, you know, it's it, bird whistles and all kinds of crazy things, you know, it was really cool. Plus, uh, Adair always m- mimics a lot of times Drum Corps International, DCI. Mm-hmm. So we would always do like Blue Devils or any of those big competition, you know, DCI bands. We would do a lot of their shows, basically. But Killer. mostly jazz. And my uh, instructor, Tim Allen, who was awesome, um, he was a big progressive jazz dude. So we were always doing some kind of out there or something. You know, he was traditional, but he also was very progressive in the same same sense coming to me, coming from, you know, concerning music so anyway so let's get back to you went to moorhead after that you got when was your first band when did you form your first band that actually gigged out i would say that's uh, going to be in uh, 75 probably in, or- in orlando uh and the the that group that i was playing with in orlando is how i ended up uh, a group came in from West Virginia, who was based out of Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia had a lot of big uh, music agencies that would book throughout the whole South. Yeah, they still do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it's a hub. Birmingham as well. Uh, and uh, we were we got called in. Some band was having a mass uh, exodus of of their keyboard player, their guitar player, and their uh, bass player. So they were going to take the three of us. They had a band together. And leaving the drummer behind, he was fine. His father built I five, so he was. Oh, you know, wow. We were just living in a garage apartment, uh, living meal to meal, and he was living in this estate. That, which that's where we would rehearse. Wow, good to have a rich drummer. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, and well, so, I tell you what, drums aren't cheap. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If my dad did not give me drums, then I probably would not be a drummer. <laughs> yeah, just because financials. <laughs> you know what I mean? So unbelievably, we joined this band, and that got us into got me hooked up into Atlanta with this agency. And then from there, I just started meeting other bands. Wow. That's super rad. Um, Orlando, I just got back from around down there. My girl, Beverly McClellan, was from Fort Lauderdale. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I actually got to march once at Disney World, which was really oh, cool. Stop it was a cool Yeah, gig. I would yeah. love that. Yeah. Wow. Well, it was with the marching band. Yeah. The marching band, because, you know, that's one thing I loved about marching band. I got to march on the Capitol. I got to go mm. to Disney World and march down there. You know, they recently did um, the Macy's Day Parade in New York City. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, represent. I always love to get to travel. And we did a lot of the Bands of America and national, you know, c- competitions and things like that. So yeah. we traveled all over. So, got a taste for that traveling early on, yeah. and it kind of stuck. Yeah, yeah. If, yeah. If the two, if you're going to be a musician, and the traveling and the practicing uh, don't don't fit, and wearing a uniform and uh, all this other stupid mm-hmm. stuff that we went through, <laughs> it's probably not going to work out. But you, you and I, we both loved it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we had the plume. 
on top of our heads. Uh, we, had, yeah. we, we had the Busby, the huge yeah. thing. It would hold a fifth. Yeah. Because <laughs> we were, you know, more head, more head was dry. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so everybody so was would, a dare. Uh, everybody would uh, get their, their bottle, and everybody, I swear, 30, 300 people with a mm. bottle in their hat. Uh, <laughs> that's hilarious. We'd be just torn up by halftime. It was so funny. Oh, wow. That's nuts. And I mean, man. you're thrown out of school if they catch you. So. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't, I was, I never drank in high school, which was interesting. Oh, you more know. for me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, Bob, what are you doing currently? Because you've got all. I know that you do the bats games. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask you how many times do you do you estimate that you played the bum 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 five hundred thousand. I bet, I bet. And I was playing all that stuff well before I got the job. I, I always thought it was just hysterical for me. That's like a drum for you, a rim shot. But yeah, exactly. Or yeah. I can I can change the mood. We could be all wearing glitter. With uh, with uh, God, flame so. throwing <laughs> and huge, I'm huge hairstyles, this. yeah. And then one of my buddies is going to come and sit in, and what do I do? Boom, 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 mm, and walk mm, him up mm, to the stage mm, doing that, mm, mm, and everybody mm, automatically mm, starts mm, clapping. Mm, mm. Oh yeah, it's in the what do you call it? Vernacular lexicon. Yeah, exactly. Everybody knows what that means, even though you're in a stinking nightclub and half people are half naked. Yeah, I love that. Doesn't matter. So when I was, I hope so. I was working up. Moved back home from Atlanta. Uh, we're skipping a lot, but we'll jump, yeah, around. Okay. we'll jump around. Yeah, yeah. And I was Skip working at a, a, a recording studio not far from here on, on Payne Street, Distillery Commons recording studio. And uh, one of the guys from the Bats came in and said, who, who can do some baseball organ recordings? Mm-hmm. Everybody pointed to me. And, is that a Rhodes that they use for that sound? No, it's a, a, an organ. Oh, just an organ sound? Yeah. yeah. I was going to tell you a funny story about that particular riff. I did a show at Actors Theater called Girlfriend that ended up taking me out to L.A., mm-hmm. and I did it again in L.A. Well, there's a piece in that show where they have to do that. They're at a baseball game. They're getting ready to go to a baseball game, and you have to play that. But the problem is it's pitch black on stage, and you can't see anything during that time, and the organ comes in when there are no lights so the keyboardist had to take the uh the glow in the dark tape and put it because if they didn't have their fingers in the right position when it was dark you couldn't see to fix it you know oh oh, stevie Wonder has that problem yeah no kidding right Uh, but that was my rim shot i need that rim shot yeah oh yeah stevie wonder probably one of the best concerts i've ever been to in my entire life i I would if i if i would go i can't go because i'll just ball the whole time Oh, yeah? I love that guy. Oh, my gosh. He is one of my all-time favorite artists. I mean, I just loved everything he put out. And I love to educate the kids and go, guess who played drums on Stevie Wonder's tracks? And they're all like, who? And I'm like, Stevie, Stevie Wonder. Wonder. <laughs> <laughs> you pretty- I remember as a kid, like, looking at his records and going, you know, on the back, the liners, it'd be like, you know, Stevie Wonder on piano, Stevie Wonder on this, Stevie Wonder. It was all Stevie Wonder until it was like Dizzy Gillespie on trumpet. Yeah. Stevie Wonder, Stevie Wonder, Stevie Wonder. You know, it's like he yeah. literally played everything. Yeah. It was nuts. And that intro to Superstition, classic. Fabulous. You know, um, there's so many songs. Uh, is it You Wish? I, I wish. wish. I Wish is one of my all time favorites. Mm. Yeah. It's just so, he's such a great artist. Man. Oh, man. Yeah. So, Bob, um, we also were talking about the bats game. You were coming from bats game last night, right? That's you right. Do, do you do that every day? Every every, every night game, they have obviously. a game, except, unless uh, Kimmet uh, calls me away. Okay, yeah, we love Kimmet. We do. Yeah. So, what are you doing with Kimmet? Um, playing in three bands with her. <laughs> and, Sounds about right. And, and I, uh, the tr- uh, trio that we had uh, started up may start again, so that would be four. But she, uh, I do the uh, from Paris. Which yeah. is an event band. Uh, you had mentioned before we went onto the air, on air, uh, you'd mentioned the Max Maxwell in your life. Oh, yeah. Max and Marvin, the whole Maxwell yeah. family. I mean, I feel like they're family to me. Because um, when I first off, I will intervene by saying this my dad used to come up here and watch Soul Incorporated all the time. Mm, that was go. one yeah. of his favorite bands. And uh, he would come up here to get his drum stuff at Durloff's a lot of times when it was back on 4th, 4th Street, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the drum cases I have are. Durloff drum cases. They've still got the badge and everything. Keep them. Yeah, because he's a vintage. He's he was a vintage drum collector, and I have a lot of vintage Ludwig's, and he collects a lot of Roger Slingerland, all that. So he was kind of a drum geek, basically. And uh, then I go 
and apply to work at Moms uh, as a teacher. Max actually hired me in, and then Marvin came in while I was there. So I got to spend literally almost every day with Marvin, you know, oh, off and on. And he would show me all kinds of crazy. He'd be like, you know, do this left-handed paradiddle thing here. I call him the Hal Blaine of Louisville because he is. Yes. Yes, and the Shuffle King, obviously. Uh, the greasy. Washing machine shuffle king. Yeah. What a, what a wonderful feel. He was in here week one, and Max is coming in. I think it's next week or week after that. Max Killer. Maxwell is coming in. Yeah, I'm trying to get all the Crasher guys in and all well, that. The, yeah. the Crashers is why Kim and I are working together. They had so much work. Yeah. That they called. Uh, Man, what a problem to have, and, right? And, yeah, I got right? too much work. And yeah. they called us in to have a meeting and uh, put us together, put a band together, and started throwing us work. So well, I love that. That well, started, I, I guess, about six years ago. Yeah, and who's the drummer for that? Is it Donnie Highland? It's Donnie Highland. I love Donnie Highland. He's another one of my faves. Uh, of course, I'm in love with all the drummers around town, you know, and uh, being at Moms, one thing I loved about it is I got to network with all these musicians yeah. that I know, and all the drummers would come in there and uh, just hang out. Dave Williams being one of them, Jeff Jarbo, sure. you know, uh, Jeff McAllister would come in every now and then. Like, oh. you just get these random cats in there, and you just get to, you know, sit around and shoot the shit with them, you know? Yeah. I ring the bell every time I say a cuss word. That's every time we donate to charity. Right there. <laughs> oh, well, damn. Let me uh, let me fucking uh, add a couple. <laughs> Throw a couple dollars in that dollars in, 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 there. in that bowl. Yeah, exactly. So, wow, that's super cool that you get to work with Kimmet. Man, I tell you what, I had not gotten to. Oh well, it's funny. We didn't technically work together, um, but we did do one song with the Queens of Drag. I think it was at Headliners. I was there. Yeah, the Ray Rizzo thing. Mm -hmm. So I was on drums for that, and Kimmet was off stage singing while the drag queen was lip syncing her yeah. stuff. So I was like, I don't know if that technically counts as working together. But then we went on to do the She Castle thing, um, and she picked four great songs, yeah. and we loved all her songs. She yeah. picked some Zeppelin, which I, of course I love. Yeah. Um, but her voice is so amazing. She's actually going to come in on the show, too. Oh, great. Yeah. Next week, I think. Yeah, next week, I, th I right. think. I need to look at my calendar. But yeah, well, she's coming in. We might have to just crash the show. You should. You, know, you should secretly, if she's her. not listening, yeah, you should not just show up. I know up. she's not listening. You know? Yeah, good. Well, you should just show up. Show and up with a keyboard and <laughs> off we go. <laughs> that would be awesome. But I, she is one of my favorite singers. I mean, she. I just love the tonality of her vocals. Me too. And she's straight up stage presence, which is a big you know, I like to say that I have quite a bit of stage presence. I think you do. I was born the week Keith Moon died, so I feel like I might have inherited his crazy soul a little bit. You know, yeah, exactly. So anyway, but yeah, I just love her. So kudos to you for that. What do you do? You have any gigs coming up? That yes, we are. Can uh, we, I have tons uh, okay. coming up with her. She's not only in from Paris. All right, what we call an event band, right? Uh, with Eric Horton, he's yes, in that. Eric's yeah, in and I want well. in here on the show too. Absolutely. Eric. Well, yeah. and he, he apologizes; he can't be here today. No worries, no worries. No, but I don't believe him. I think he's just out horsing around. I uh, probably, yeah. Uh, but we're also. I'm also lucky enough to play with her in. in uh, uh, Back to Mac, the Fleetwood Mac tribute band. Right. And is Ray Rizzo in on that? Yes, yeah, exactly right. Ray, Ray is a good friend of mine. I love Ray Rizzo. Another drummer I'm in love with. Right. You know, and. Uh, uh, also, we're in the, the Tom Petty tribute band called Those Damn Torpedoes, and we're getting ready to play next week. All of these bands yeah. from Paris, Those Damn Torpedoes, and uh, Back, to, Back Mac. to Mac are all going to be playing within the span of four days. Wow. Next That's week. super cool, yeah. To, uh, uh, from Paris at the fair on Thursday and Friday, Thursday and Saturday. Kentucky State Fair. Yep. Uh, Bud Tent, mm -hmm. come out. Everybody come out. We're on at 8.30 uh, on Thursday and Saturday. Uh, we're at Prohibition uh, Craft Beer, mm -hmm. a new place for us with the uh, the torpedoes. That's Friday, those damn torpedoes. Mm -hmm. And then Sunday is the concert that never was at Iroquois Amphitheater with four tribute bands. And you, you'll love this. It's uh, uh, Steely Danish. Who I love. I know all those cats. Yeah, They start the show. Then I heart heart with Carly Johnson. Who I also I'm trying to get Carly Johnson on the show, but I've had a couple members of that band in already. Awesome. They were I heart heart. What a great name! Absolutely, <laughs> for and Kim, I think Kimmet band. is going to join them for a tune. Yeah, I think she is. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, El Fo, uh, <laughs> Eric's in that uh, Eric's in that band. That's ELO El band. Yeah. Oh wow, what uh, a cool name too. Then our Back to Mac uh, group comes on, and it's all going to happen within the span of four or five hours and we're, we'll be done in time for people to get their kids home it's all ages so very cool I hope everybody looks for that the concert that never was to four tribute bands starting at 5 30 on at iroquois amphitheater on uh 
this Sunday, August 25th. Well, that is so rad. I love that. Very cool, man. So if you can get you, uh, you know, if you can get out to any of those shows, do it to it. That's the one cool thing that I love about Louisville. Every time I try to leave here, because I don't have any family here, so I consider the musical community my family, the LGBT community my family. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've often thought about moving away multiple times, and every time I do, it just sucks me right back in. You know, there's so many different genres of musicians here. There's so much work. You know, there's just so many uh, like community oriented music, musical scenes here. And what's mind blowing to me is like, you know, Girl Woods playing uh, down the street, not uh, this weekend. And uh, I don't know if you know anything about them. But, I do. You know, I mean, that we have that type of scene, LRS Fest. We've got all these like metalhead kids scene. And I will walk up into a tap room on a Tuesday night and there's a hundred people there, you know, like, wow cookie mm-hmm. cutter kind of stuff you know um we also <clears throat> excuse me also have a great cover band scene around here all kinds of cover band work uh the original scenes pop in. it's like we have the jazz scene we have the blue scene at stevie ray's literally we have a a potpourri per se of the coolest musicians and music around town here and it's uh, quite a niche you know i don't feel like i get that when i go to nashville because i'm down there a lot um, and maybe it's just because I'm not in the scene as much, but it just doesn't seem as tight down there as it is here. A lot of know? competition, a lot of people from out of town. Yeah. Uh, little little mini communities rather than one large one like we have, we're mm-hmm. lucky enough to have here. And we're a small town. Yeah, we are a small town. I know everybody knows everybody here. That's why I'm surprised yeah. that we had yeah, met, until, shock. met until today. Right. Yeah, but Kimmett was telling me all kinds of crazy, awesome things about you, so um, that made me think, oh, I need to hit him up and get him in, yeah, in the show. Any other cool things going on? Uh, You know, every Sunday with the Pranksters at Melwood Tavern, I I love Melwood Tavern, I think it's one of the finest music venues I've ever ever performed in. They have the early service, which starts at 5.30. Uh, that plays outdoors and all the great bands. That That's on Sunday, playing. you said? Uh-huh, every Sunday. Mm-hmm. And this is going on, I mean, 52 It's Sundays like a, a year. Grateful Dead church, basically. It, it's exactly yeah. right. And, of course, we, we're much more varied than that, but uh, yeah. it's a lot of fun there and yeah. always look forward. Do the pranksters <clears throat> still do... Did they only do Grateful Dead no, tunes? No, that's what I'm yeah, thinking. They, yeah, they it's, we're all around. over the place. Paul Simon, the yeah. Beatles... Uh, All kinds of stuff. I just saw them at some random street party uh, in the Highlands. I don't know if you were playing that or not. I don't think you were. I'm usually only in the Sunday Night Band. Okay, I was going to say, because I just saw them play not too long ago for some kind of uh, party. Maybe Fourth of July party or something. It was perfect. You just said it. Random. Yeah. Yeah, It was very random. You got something random going on. Well, that's what I love about the pranksters, man. It's like, you know, back in the day, or at least when I say back in the day, at least like 20 years ago, uh, I used to catch them at Gerstle's all the time. I was new in town and I was like, oh. Ooh, Mary Pranksters, that's a Grateful Dead take. And then mm-hmm. I was always a deadhead myself. So um, I just thought it was kind of fascinating. And I loved the band. And I got to play with them a couple times off and on throughout the years. Really? You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just on random gigs like at Gersel's or something like that. There but it is again, random. Random. Yeah, random. Well, Bob, it's so awesome to have you up in the studio. We're going to take a short break. I do want to remind everybody, though, that you can join LRS102.com at the Tiger Room. That's this Saturday, August 17th from 9 until midnight for the SWP CD release party, Trans Am Jams. Not only will you get new music from an LRS Fest artist, SWP, but you'll also have a shot to win free Louder Than Life tickets and a chance to save $10 on special discounted LRS Fest tickets. Great music, great venue, great times, and it's all with the Walrus, LRS102.com. That's this Saturday from 9 until midnight. Be there. Bob, have you ever heard of the Tiger Room? I haven't, and I can't wait to go there. (laughs) Guess what it is. What is it? It's in the back of Trixie's. All the right. strip club. <laughs> I like it so far. And they call it the Tiger Room because they bought the oh. old toy tiger. Oh. The old toy tiger sign. Yeah, the and sign. And they put I, it back there. I heard about this. I and heard now rock about bands, that. like hard fabulous. rock bands are playing. I used to play there Strip clubs. I... Hey. <laughs> it can't get much better, can it? No. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to take a short break. I'm going to spin some... Talking Heads, once in a lifetime. You're locked on to Generation Nation, LRS102.com, The Walrus, Louisville's Rockstream. 
asked uh, everybody on the show today, band geeks. We got our start oh, yeah. marching band. Isn't yeah. that crazy? Love like it. I said, it always goes back in here to either marching band or church. One of the two. And uh, Marjorie Marshall was in and she was talking how most everything goes back to church at some point yeah. in the black gospel stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And like you said, you're a big funk and a soul cat. You know, you love all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to introduce you to LaVon Fisher Wilson if you don't know her. I know. I need to know this lady. Yeah. She was on the show not too long ago. She actually was on Broadway in New York City in the color purple behind like Fantasia. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, uh, she's been in Newsies and a, a bunch of cool stuff. But she runs. Here in Louisville, the Queens of Funk and Soul Music. Stop it. Yeah, the Queens of Funk and Soul, that's her name. And uh, mm. I'm the uh, LaVon Fisher-Wilson and the Vondettes. And I mean, it's a throwback to all that old school stuff where the women had the outfits and the dance moves and they're doing all that yeah. cool, you know, they do everything from Shaka Khan to Tina Turner to all, Aretha, the big, you know, the big artist. Um, and they are just awesome. I'm going to get to back her um, mm-hmm. with Jimmy Brown, Donna Bivens, and Jessica Bullock on instruments at the Louisville Pride, which is the Highlands Pride. Um, they shut down Bardstown Road and put a big old stage like the size of the chow wagon. Yeah, I've been there and seen it. Yeah, and boom, we're going to hit that hard come September 21st. I'm proud of you. Thank you. I wish I, I was in town. We we're, were out of town playing somewhere. Yeah, you're always out of town somewhere. I, I, just, you know. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I wish I was, I was here. I was also going to ask you, do you and LRS go back? Well, I I used to know one of the disc jockeys that worked here way back in the day who was a who would who would DJ at a nightclub mm-hmm. that I used to play at in oh, yeah. the 80s. What was that nightclub? Uh, Some place called, uh, oh, God. I thought you were going to say the Toy Tiger. That's why I asked. No, uh, this was out on my end of town off of Terry Road. Oh, uh, live God, what was the name of this place? Uh, I can't believe I've <laughs> I've drawn a blank. But That's okay. It'll hit you later. We used to do six nights, mm-hmm. and we'd be so worn out. We were on the road constantly, but this is the only joint that did six nights, and it was like six sets. So we would tape ourselves mm-hmm. on Tuesday. Oh, wow. And, and then fake the rest of the week so we could rest our voices. Oh, wow. And Travis, with the, this disc jockey, who was a real late night, low key guy, yeah. like is trying to get Jack. us to stop in the middle of a set. Wow. And we can't because the tape's rolling. <laughs> it was he, like Millie Vanilli before Millie Vanilli. It was just saying, it was, somebody was parked incorrectly because, uh, fellas, I need to stop. And we yeah. just tear into the next song yeah. because it was recorded on Tuesday. Uh, That's mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, it was funny, funny. You know, I got to work with um, Sarah Lee of the B fifty twos. She was the bass player. She oh. she actually started with Gang of Four. She's across the pond, as we say. Um, toured with the Thompson Twins and B fifty. She's on Love Shack. That's her on bass. On yeah, they, you, well, they all started in Ath- uh, Athens, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm very yes, familiar with exactly. that. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Atlanta. Played there all the time. Go ahead. Cool. Um, she when she was on tour with the Thompson Twins, she was telling me stories that they had tape machines underneath their stage that had their backing vocals oh, on. You know it. And she was like, if we were one beat per minute off, those backing vocals would come in in the wrong spots. My and God. I thought, how terrifying would that be? Yeah, absolutely. This is before synchronization. Yes, you know. before all you the MIDI to... syncing and all that. It was before computers, basically. I, you know. uh, after I got off the road with Leon, uh, I had already quit. The Leon. I used to play with Leon Russell mm-hmm. there briefly. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, Super cool. Uh, I, I took a job with Asia, the band Asia, mm-hmm. and the keyboard player, Jeff Downs. He's the guy who wrote Video Kill the Radio Star right. in The Buggles. The Buggles, He yeah. put the Asia together, and he had all of their background vocals. On bass pedals, you were talking about bass pedals earlier. Yeah, for the keyboard, he the would, organ. They, these were MIDI bass pedals, and he had two fully blown out samplers with all of their studio vocals. Wow. Background vocals on them. And he would step on the button, and it would do only time will tell. And he'd step on the next button, and it would do the next yeah. mind blow. And that's why yeah. he had to have, I, I was his tech, because yeah. I, I knew how to run a sampler. And yeah. I was constantly changing the... The discs out while he was using one. I'm changing <laughs> the other one. Back then, you had to change the disc it's, out to it get was the sound. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so I'm run, I'm changing the discs behind him, getting ready for the next tune, of the next batch of massive yeah. samples of, of background vocals. That's funny you mentioned. That. Yeah, and that's the drummer, wild. The drummer had a LED lit. Mm-hmm. If I could describe it for the listeners, it's like a big smile of LED, oh, and wow. like a conductor going left to right. Weird, like a metronome, like almost. a metronome, yeah. but left to right. Because, so there was some grease in it still. Mm-hmm. It wasn't blip, blip, blip. Yeah, it swung like that, wow. so he could 
it was easier for him to man. I'd never seen that before. Mm-hmm. It was a rack mounted thing. Weird. And it was just like a guy was conducting, so he could get a little ahead, a little behind, mm-hmm. but the vo- background vocals would still work out. And they couldn't be very long, of course. Yeah, I'm because, sure. You know, if they keep going and going and going, you're, fine, you're ultimately yeah. going to get away from yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Which is crazy because I, I, uh, when I was working with Beverly McClellan, she didn't know anything about technology, nor did she want to know anything about technology. She was one of the best artists I ever played with. Girl, never had a lesson in her life. Grew up in church. Piano player. Amazing piano player. Also amazing vocalist. Also a great guitar player. She toured with B.B. King before he died, and Steve Vai actually yeah. had her guitar made for her oh. overseas. So she had all these really cool connections, and um, I would be like, she was like, how are we going to do, because we did an electronic, well, we did a record, but most of it was electronic based, mm-hmm. and she had never done anything like that. I was majorly pulling her outside of her box. She was mainly blues. In fact, her management at the time were like, no, we don't like this direction, because you need to do another blues record. And I said, dude, you've done six blues records, like, you know, branch out, you can do everything, you can do all these, you know, she loved hip hop and all this cool stuff. So um, we became friends. I started recording her here in the Highlands. And she just was like, how is this all going to work? So what I did was, without her knowing, and she loved to do this to me on stage. She never had a set list, ever. And it was just the two of us. (laughs) And she loved to mess with me. She was always messing with me. In fact, I think spiritually she still messes with me Uh. because she's passed (laughs) over now. But um, she would always on stage, you know, I'd be like, what are we playing today? Oh, I don't know. Whatever happens. She loved the magic of the moment, which was pretty good. And she was great at it, improv and all that. So she'd be like, hey, go out there and start a solo or whatever. You know, like we're starting the show. You go a solo and I'll come out whenever. You know, it's just I I never knew where she was going to go with anything. And she loved to mess with me on stage live. Um, So I pulled the her on her one day. And she was like, how are we going to do these songs live? And I said, "Uh, because I have a box that I can program that will do all kinds of crazy things. So I took a song, I chopped it up into loops and programmed it to like continually loop and where I could trigger it on and off. And um, and then add. I took her vocals off of the record, like just a, like her uh, harmony or something or her saying something. And then I would put it on there to like trigger as a one shot. And then on stage one day in at in Kansas City at Pride Festival in front of like thousands of people, I hit that thing and was like, we're going to do this song. Go. <laughs> I pulled her on her <laughs> because she was always trying to mess me up on stage uh, and get you know and just like mess with me. So I did that and it forced her to do it. And she was like, "How'd you do that?" You know, I'm triggering her background vocals. How'd you do that? I'm like, I just hit a button. I just had to pre-program it. You know, and then she was like, "Wow, you really are a techie geek." Because as soon as the electronics came out, I had the big octagon like. You know, the pads and the old Tama kind of like, you know, the one that oh, yeah. literally just did a hand clap and a ching ching kind yeah. of thing. That was it. Yeah. Like, and the Toms were like, choom, cha choom, choom, yeah. those things, you know? Um, and I was always big on the 808s and the 909s and figuring out who's using what. Because, I mean, Michael Jackson used them. Sure. Madonna used them. Prince used them. All over. Still Whitney used. Houston. I, I still hear them. Yeah. And you can't play some of that stuff, you know, or cover some of that stuff without having those sounds. Yeah. I mean, it does not sound anything like, right. you know. Low, they're real low fidelity, uh, low bit quality. Mm-hmm. Yes. But it's distinct. They become their own sound. Yes. And now they're very famous. Yeah. Um, especially like the cowbell on the 808s and yeah. the bass drops and all. All that Toom. stuff. In fact, I've gotten gigs um, <clears throat> doing nothing but playing electronics behind bands because they don't know how to do it. And then I'm like, well, I can do any sound you want. What drum machine do you want? The Lynn drum machine? You know, because now you can just pull it up, get the, and a digital sound is a digital sound. There's no other, you know, you can recreate it so easily. Yeah. You just take that sound and then you put it, trigger it on something, you mm-hmm. know. So, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to know quite a bit about electronics and i always add electronics into my original my acoustic kit so i can have hand claps or i can do 80s hip-hop loops or whatever i want it's pretty cool yeah yeah but i was a big fan obviously of like um, phil collins growing up and all these drummers i met this drummer awesome drummer down in nashville he's actually out in phoenix and he toured with cheap trick for a while and a bunch of other people his name is craig cramp and um, he also is a great producer. Um, he is the original. He's had a hit in every decade that he's drummed on, oh. which is fascinating. He was with the hotels back in the day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then he went on to not the motels, but the hotels. The hotels. That's right. <laughs> the better, the better version, you know. Um, 
So, yeah, and then he went on to be the drummer on Betty Davis Eyes by Kim Carnes. Oh, I love that. And he was telling me a story about they hired him in specifically to record that because he was one of the only drummers back in the day that knew how to work the electronics. And they wanted to mix electronics with acoustic drums. If you go back and listen to Betty Davis Eyes, mm. there's a great mix of both. And, uh, you know, that was a huge hit for him. He went on to produce Melissa Etheridge and drums on her. Somebody bring me some water. He toured with Patty Loveless. I mean, he's literally, oh, and the best one, I forgot what he, the main thing he did was he co-wrote Oh Sherry with Steve Perry and drums oh. on that. He toured with Steve Perry well, for a long time. he's made a couple of pennies then. Slightly, <laughs> slightly. And he was a great mentor to me. You know, he had known my family for a long time and stuff like that. And he just kind of. Uh, you know, gave me all kinds of cool tips, and uh, you know, he's still out there drumming somewhere. But he he was on tour with Cheap Trick last time I checked, and a bunch of other like rock bands. But man, one of the uh, one another great, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like there are so many drum drummers that you might not have ever heard of that have been on all these hits. So now every time I hear that song, I'm like, oh yeah, I know that drummer guy. You know, <laughs> oh listen to that track. You know, <laughs> man, it, he he's a cool dude though. But he he knew his stuff, and he was based out of Nashville there for a little while. I think he was in the music union there or something like that mm. yeah but anyway super cool dude i wanted to go back to you said before asia who was the other band that you mentioned i was on a road briefly there with leon russell yeah leon russell so he has a son now mm -hmm. and Teddy his, Jack. yeah and, and uh, one of my friends eric hyman out in oklahoma and his son are best friends uh -huh. and eric has toured with leon as an opener act with the son and uh, what a small world leon russell yeah. super awesome dude oh, man he was uh, such a mentor I, only, I bet. I, tell me a little bit about him, because a lot of our our listeners may be too young to know who Leon Russell was. They shouldn't be, but uh, I mean, one of the greats. Well, he uh, was uh, one of the original uh, members of the Wrecking Crew, the sound, uh, the the recording Hal session Blaine, band. Yeah. yeah, Hal Blaine and all those uh, cats. He was on all of the Carol uh, Carol K. Carol K. The old man. By the way, when I went to L.A., another funny story because we're just overlapping all these stories. Right, right. When I went to L.A., my bass player and my lead guitar player who are both big time on tour with everybody, um, had taken lessons from Carol Kay. And they were like, they were telling me stories that she is so jazz and so theory that, and they're both theory too. They're both very trained players um, who can read and everything. And they were like, she was just on another planet with it. Oh, yeah. That they didn't even understand. And they both came out of the lessons being like, did you get any, you know, like, <laughs> what What was that all about? But yeah, Carol Kay, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of Hal, Hal Blaine, obviously. Rest yeah. in peace, he just Rest passed. I just I took um, a picture of his drum kit and his and his date book. Mm -hmm. uh, but just came from the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow. That guy, The if you look at his uh, discography, how many thousands of hits that this guy played on? Oh, and, it's ridiculous! And then to die I've seen almost it. Almost penniless. It's just unbelievable. And almost died penniless. I wonder mean, why that is. I don't know, man. Uh, you know, how know. can you play on "I Got You, Babe" and not have a penny to your and, name? And those recordings are fabulous. Yeah. Well, I will tell you this, and I don't know if she'd want me telling this on the air, but I don't care because <laughs> it's my show. But Sarah Lee, you know, is on Cosmic Thing with the B fifty twos, and. She didn't get hardly a penny. Well, from there you any go. Yeah, that's uh, you, you get paid for the session, and that see mm -hmm. you. Yeah, well, but she toured with them for a long time. Well, like she did, but she um, didn't get she didn't get invested in the band. It sounds like. Yeah, and it, and uh, she went on to tour with the Indigo Girls and a bunch of other people, um, and she's still playing around. She was last time I talked to her, she was playing with Robert Fripp. I mean, mm, you know, well. can't get much better than that. But right. Awesome, classically trained, but man, every time I hear Love Shack now, I'm like, that's my girl Sarah Lee, and she didn't get much for that. You know, and just, I'm sorry, but without that bass line, what is Love Shack? Yeah, well, and the drum part, <laughs> yeah. the drum part's kicking. Yeah, well, evidently they went in and fired their bass player and drummer and was like, oh, we're just going to sell it as the front four singers, mm. and then they could hire any, any Joe any, Blow yeah. in. Yeah, and, and yeah. pay them a lot less and then go it their own way, which, you know, bands got to do what the bands got to do. But I, from what I understand, it was a lot of more of the management. Um, it sounds like a management thing. Yeah, didn't they do the same thing to Rod Stewart in The Faces? Uh, probably, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I think the story is something like, you know, he was with The Faces for a long time, and we all loved those tracks with The mm -hmm. Faces. And I think that The Faces actually recorded on a lot of his earlier hits, but the, his management were like, no, you got to do it solo. Drop the band and go this way, you know, and that's what he did. Yeah, and got a bunch of cute guys, Carmen Apice and a bunch of those guys. 
Yeah, gosh, you got to love Carmen Apice. I love his book, Realistic Rock. I teach out of it all the time. Do you? Yeah, there's a funny story about him, too, that um, he talks about, well, there's a couple stories. First off, he said, one of my favorite drummers of all time, Tony Williams, he said that he saw him as a kid, and he said he was the only drummer that just made his jaw drop he was in 20 kid. seconds. He was 18 when he, when he started playing with Miles. I mean, you know. Miles Davis, right? He was like yeah. a child kid prodigy yeah. on jazz drumming, yeah. But anyway, uh, Carmen Apice obviously wrote a very famous drum book called Realistic Rock, that if you study and you read, you better read that one. And it's got a lot of triplet kicks in there, six tuplet triplet kicks, and uh, it kind of teaches you that style. And he talked about how, you know, John Bonham was very famous for his triplet kick drum patterns. And evidently they were on tour at one point together. And he was, Carmen was talking to John Bonham and he was saying, you know, man, we're, you know, like good times, bad times. If you listen to good times, bad times, probably about 20 seconds in, you're going to start to hear that kick pattern underneath. And then by the end of that song, he's doing it for like, you know, the, a minute straight. It's something crazy on crappy, you know, not that they were crappy, Speed King pedals, but they were way different back then than yeah. they would, than these chain driven, easy, oh, yeah, easy, yeah. easy things we have today. It's incredibly hard because I actually own a couple Speed Kings to get those patterns out as fast as he did. So uh, Carmen evidently asked him, he said, where'd you get that kick pattern from? And he said, I got it from you, listening to a Vanilla Fudge record. And he was like, I never did that, you know. And uh, evidently, what had happened was Bonham had heard it incorrectly, and and Carmen was doing it on his hands, not his feet, or something along those oh, lines. Yeah, probably floor tom, kick floor tom, something yeah, like that. Yeah, you know, I'm talking about, yes, where you're doing like, yeah. You know, hat, kick, kick, hat, kick, kick, hat, kick, kick, that kind of pattern. And uh, evidently, Carmen looked at him and said, I wasn't doing that. Uh -huh. That's not like the recording uh, might have sounded like that, but that's not what I was doing. And uh, and they just had a big laugh over it because he had studied it thinking <laughs> he had played it one way and then created something amazing. When, when you and Matt were talking about your nomenclature for the triplets. Yeah. What, what did you say yours was? Oh, hamburger, fries, and Coke. I, I thought well, most of my buddies... Do soda bottle, soda bottle, and soda la bottle, soda la bottle, soda la bottle. Oh, I love that. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I always teach six tuplets. Well, you know, I always teach that trip. When I when I start my kids out, um, I start them out on what I call the rhythm tree, and I kind of developed my own style of teaching over the years. I'm giving away my secrets, but it's fine. <laughs> but I start them out by learning what a quarter note is. We don't. I don't deal with half notes and whole notes because in drumming, um, in order to sustain a sound for a long period of time, more than one count, two counts, three counts four counts we have to learn to roll and so rolling is one of the more harder things to teach it's more advanced so i don't start out with that i start out right with the quarter note and try to teach them that most songs are either going to be based off of a quarter note feel or an eighth note feel you just got to figure out what the count is right so i teach them and we do this practice every day on hands and then once they get good at hands then we do it on feet i have them go from quarter notes with a metronome 70 beats per minute quarter notes all the way around the drums if they're just snare drum you know we learn on snare drum first and then i'll teach it how to move it around but quarter notes into eighths and then eighth note triplets because you're going from ones to twos to threes mm, sure. then fours i usually skip fives because those are pretty advanced quintuplets we'll learn those later then i teach the sixth tuplet the 16th note triplet and then 32nd note so i have them do that forwards and backwards because you're speeding your hand speed up and then you're slowing your hand speed oh, yeah. down, which requires more control because going slower is much requires more control, so it's harder. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's really you're teaching a kit. Yeah, there's no reason to, to do a paradiddle, slamadiddle, slam accuse, double paradiddle, mm -hmm. because that's all snare. Yeah. stuff yeah uh you might as well you know get them all hands and feet and start with the quarter note. yeah you're absolutely right so i do the hands and teach them that on their hands and you know by the time that they can understand all of those rhythms then we go back and go okay well here's a 16th note sounds like da 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 right and then what's going to happen if we take out the e of that da 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 you know or what, what happens if we take out the e and da 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 to, you know, and and I just teach them rhythm that way, and then they have a really good foundation of what they hear and how to put it here, and then we go back, and then I teach, and I actually stole this one from a guy named Stephen O'Reilly when I was at Mom's. He had this great practice for his feet. His he was one of the best double kick players I'd ever seen because um, he was a metal guy, and he'd done nothing but study his feet his whole life. Well, I had done nothing but marching bands study my hands mostly. Um, so he gave me a practice where you just start doing a four on the floor groove with everything, hi-hat, snare, and kick. Your foot is doing the quarter notes on the first one, four on the floor. And then your foot switches to eighths, 
your hands never change. Right. And then they switch to the eighth note triplets and then sixteenths. And then you go all the way up to six triplets or thirty seconds if you can make it, you know, depending on how slow or fast the, the tempo is that you set. So I found by doing that every day, you know, multiple times, that it just made the kids like hands super strong and then feet super strong, you know. Mm-hmm. And I try to work on each individual limb with them. You know, trying to get one super strong and super independent of the other. And, you know, and then I found that, wow, these kids kind of just take off. And then next thing you know, they're doing all these six double patterns and all that stuff. You know, I just teach whatever is the easiest way for you to remember it. Go with it. You know, learn the foundation of counting so that you can communicate with other musicians when you're playing with them. Um, I always teach them how to read. But I found the younger they are, the easier it is for them to read. I mean, they just, you know, and I try not to, I t- try to detour them from going into, you know, finding, um, what are these called, uh, not, oh, tabs. Mm. I try to defer them. For, I'm like, don't do tabs because it's just like a generic computer way of music when you just need to read actual notation. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah. And you never know who's writing that stuff. I have um, tried to use tabs several times and I'm just like, what is this? It's mumbo jumbo yeah, to me. Everything I, I download, I always have to correct. Yeah, it's exactly. all wrong. People are people yeah. with half a clue who are put, right. putting this stuff. Up. Yeah, there's ten year olds writing tab out there. You know what I'm saying? And uh, if it's musical notation, usually it's somebody who's taken a lot more time to decipher mm-hmm. stuff. And there was a time in my my teaching life where I just started collecting books. I would buy every drum book I could find or old school book that somebody could find to give to me. And I would just start reading through that left and right, you know? So my reading chops got pretty great. And my chops are, my reading sight reading skills are pretty good. They're not the best of like some of these cats out there in the orchestra. But yeah, I write charts, but not, you know, I'll add a notation now and then, but most of the stuff that I'm playing, it's all, it's all just chord charts and slashes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I try to, well, it depends on what the gig is. If it's just like a basic cover gig, what I'll do is I'll go back, notate the intros, the stops, the time signature, the tempos. I always like to have a visual tempo kind of to get me in the ballpark. Right. Um, And then I'll write, okay, this is the main groove plate. You can play around with it. Do you ever write in the margins? Sounds like another tune. Yeah, oh yeah. I do that all the time. Oh, yeah. Well, it's funny when I teach like, you know, a basic rock beat, I'm like, yeah, well, this is the rock beat that's on like yeah. Beat It by Michael Jackson and a cabillion other songs. And, and you know? I, I do that. I just, like, this, you know, uh, think, think, blah, well, you know, mm-hmm. some title of another tune. And it takes me right there, especially when we're like on the uh, Barnstable party where there's so much coming at you. Oh, yeah. I uh, bet that would be it's, a crazy it's gig. Just, and we're con- it's so compressed. Hey, real quick. Time com- yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. I was just going to say that, that you have so little time, you can't get anything under your belt. Mm-hmm. So any any little reference, any mnemonic that you can come up with mm-hmm. to remind you, oh, yeah, that's how that goes. Yeah. Because it's coming at you, and there's the guy, and you got to do it right now, and you get one chance to do it. And- yeah, exactly. I was going to ask you, what's the like? name some of the cooler artists that you've gotten to really oh. play with. Because that, that party you're talking about, the big derby party, yeah. um, man, there's been some amazing people through that. So I would think you got to back almost everybody, right? Uh, it's, uh, I've, I've gotten to back uh, um, um, Travis Graham Tripp. Nash. Graham Nash, yeah. cool. We pulled him up on the side of the stage, and, and uh, we did uh, teach your children. Uh, we, he wasn't even ready for that. Mm-hmm. We worked work something up. Just a song before you go, we did that one. But then I said, let's do teach your children. We didn't even rehearse it, and we pulled it off. It was the best part of the night. <laughs> Those um, are the best. Uh, Smokey Robinson was great. Mm. Smokey Robinson oh, he sang oh, right to wow. me. We we played his first song, and then he came back and said, "This stuff's too high." You know, we we had learned the record <laughs> keys. I like your how your voice just so, went really high. So he turned to me and said, <laughs> "What else have you got?" And I had to sing to Smokey Robinson. Yeah. His face is right there. Oh, and wow. I'm singing his song to him, and we keep de- we keep going down in half steps. Mm-hmm. Too high. Still too high. <laughs> Until he found the one he wanted and he counted mm-hmm. us off. Yeah. Well, everybody was reading the charts. Mm-hmm. So now we're playing in a completely different key. Mm-hmm. Three, four, and we're into it. I mean, this, mm-hmm. that kind of wow. thing. Chaka Khan was fabulous. Oh, I love she her. She came several years in a I row. I know her female drummer, too. I've gotten she, to play gigs with her. She's a dr- great mm-hmm. drummer. Oh, Chaka Khan's an amazing drummer. Make sure when Max Maxwell comes mm-hmm. on the show, sure. you ask, he was the drummer on, on the gig at um, that time. Okay, cool. Uh, she came back and played, he, she brought her. Uh, um, music director with her. I used to set up an L back then, and he mm-hmm. played one of my keyboards, and I played the other. And they, we did Brick House with her on the drums. Wow! 
and super red. He broke it down into instead of shake it down, shake it down, shake it down. Now it was chaka con, chaka con, chaka con, <laughs> and she played this drum so oh, low, yeah. dude. Oh, dude, she's that was awesome. fierce. Mm-hmm. She ripped her thousands of dollar dress getting back on the Max's kit. <laughs> I love it. I mean, ask Max about it. He, I he will. Was, I mean, she just played. Her well, I tell you what, off. a lot of people don't even know. She's kind of like a Stevie Wonder in that she, sense. They recognize her as a front singer, yeah. but not as a drummer. Well, Karen Carpenter, the same oh, way. Fabulous. She's one great. of the best drummers of all time, but also a and beautiful singing. vocalist. Yes. Singing while she's playing drums. Correct. She's in the book, man. I, I mean, don't know Rufus, uh, Rufus uh, Chaka was the drummer for Rufus, mm-hmm. and they said, we got to have her out front. Yeah. Let's hire another drummer. Yeah. Wow. She's fabulous. Well, that's cool. I will definitely ask her, uh, ask him about that because uh, I'm a huge fan of Chaka Khan. Um, and Get, every time I hear her name, I think of the Whitney Houston track where she's like, Chaka Khan, you know, in the background. Right. Yeah. Every I'm every woman. Uh, well, and we yeah. did that one for her. Oh, you yeah, did? She cool. Was fabulous. Oh, wow. What uh, a cool uh, gig. Kid Rock, of course, a lot. Uh, Gene Simmons was great. Oh, Gene Simmons, yeah. Um, it's been a lot. We, Did he do the tongue thing? No, no, he was real cool. Of <laughs> course, he had cool, the yeah. MTV crowd following Crew, him around, yeah. and his wife and her sister and their gigantic, mm-hmm. uh, large-breasted Amazon lady. <laughs> large-breasted Amazon lady. I mean, that sounds way right up my alley. I mean, she's just like you know, there's like six four or something. I yeah. mean, it's amazing. Wow, man, you've had some crazy, crazy cool experiences. It's been yeah, fun. I was gonna say that brown stable is it brown stable barn stable, barn stable brown party. Mm-hmm. I, ne- I always get it backwards. Um, yeah, one of my favorite stories bringing up Max and that party, and it could have been the same one. I don't know, but uh, I've never been to that party. It's, obviously, it's very expensive. Oh, I know it is, and you have to have like special invites and all this stuff. But I used to live really close to Cherokee road right? right which is around the area of where it is sure. um and derby night i was riding with one of my friends and it was really dark and it was during this party um and we didn't know we were in the area and all of a sudden max comes out on the side of the street and he's crossing the street of course with this crazy hair mm. and my friend went oh my gosh there's rod stewart <laughs> Uh, she thought Max Maxwell uh, was uh, Rod Stewart, and he was oh, going to the br- that party that you're talking about. He'll love to hear that. Yeah, you should tell him that right off. Well, the bat. it was dark, and he it, all she had to go off of was the hair, basically. But you know, I I got a big kick out of that because That's I was fabulous. like, that was my boss. <laughs> I was like, that is not Rod Stewart. <laughs> oh yeah, so it's been it's been an uh, it's interesting, and Max is such a great player too. I would yeah. think you are lucky enough to play behind him, Donnie Highland, Paul Culligan. You've named some of the best drummers in town. Maybe the luck is theirs. Ah, let's look at it that way. I think it is theirs because when I posted that uh, you were going to be on the show today, everybody was like, "The man, the you know, the myth, the legend," and everybody seemed to. Lo- they were like, "Man, Bob Ramsey is my favorite." You know. Oh well, I'm glad to hear so. that. Now, yeah, well, you know, I'm just kidding. I was kidding about that. <laughs> I was going to say, well, Bob, it's been so awesome to have you up in Thank the studio. Um, you're a part of a billion different projects. You know, you can check if people want to tune it, you know, check you out. Uh, the Iroquois Amphitheater thing, the Back to Mac, mm-hmm. right? A uh, gig you've got coming up from Paris that's more of a corporate event type stuff. Mm-hmm. You can catch you on the river stage half the time. Right. I know you're over there at Bats baseball games. Every, every get Bats um, baseball Yeah, and all the other projects you're doing. And hopefully, we'll get to jam together soon because i would oh, love that it's gonna happen yes let's make that happen absolutely um that's bob ramsey piano meister um yeah and uh you just keep on rocking man that's what we do right appreciate as musicians. It. appreciate you yeah thank you for coming on lrs my i'm pleasure. glad to have you my pleasure and i want everybody to tune in tomorrow because i've got this awesome chick named sydney coming in from jukebox heroes and uh, we're gonna leave it today with some ac doocy some tnt let's blow that shit up Yay! Tune in to Generation Nation every day, Monday through Friday, LRS102.com, The Walrus. And as always, keep it groovy.